um, there were two worksheets due yesterday and today, right? Is that right? Today and tomorrow. Yeah. Today and tomorrow. And I posted another one for realism, which is where we'll get tonight, that it won't be due till next week. And I think what I'm going to do after that, because we're running behind and I really want you to focus on your, uh, your term papers, that I will make worksheets 9 and 10, anyone after Monday, will be optional. And what that means is I'll grade on the best eight. Does that make sense? So if you look back through your scores and you've got some that were kind of shoddy earlier on, you might want to do one more to bump that one out of the mix. Does that make sense? So there'll still be 10 worksheets, but you'll be graded on the best eight, which means you can, you can shift gears after this. You guys are looking at me like this. I'm talking in Swahili. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes? Clear? Right? You will be graded on the best eight, whatever those best eight are. They could be the eight you've already turned in. They could be all ten. Right? And I'll choose the best eight. Okay? That gives you the opportunity to make up if you're not. I'd hate to just say there aren't any more if somebody's going, God, I needed those other ones because I didn't do so good at first. Right? That wouldn't be fair. So this is the fairest way. Okay? So, again, um, after the one that's due on Monday the 27th, which is worksheet number 8, after that the worksheets will be, 9 and 10, will be optional. And, again, we'll replace a lower bad score, or if they suck, <laughs> they just won't count them. Right? Okay? So I'll take the best eight. All right? Okay, we were talking, we started to talk at the very beginning of end of class, right? We got here, yeah? About Los Caprichos and this new movement called Romanticism, which was born in the late 18th century, around the same time as Neoclassicism, but really began as a answer to Neoclassicism, as a response to Neoclassicism, and both neoclassicism and romanticism are based on, on um, enlightenment era philosophy, right? But the, the major philosophers sort of differ. And for romanticism, it's Rousseau and his central precept that man longs to be free, but the world holds him back. And the romantics take this add into it the revolutions in France and America where man fought for freedom and come up with a new art that focuses on those times, those places in the world where we might find the sort of freedom that Rousseau says we don't have. And these can be found in romantic art, whether it's poetry or music or visual art, these can be found in periods of history where logic isn't so strong. They love the Middle Ages, right? The era of faith. They can be find, found in moments in the human condition, moments in life, when uh, logic doesn't play such a strong role in governing, like sleep, like madness, like death. I guess that's not really a moment in life. I guess it is a moment in life, right? It's the one that we can all count on. And they find it in nature, which man cannot control to this day, right? So that's what we find as we look at Romanticism are these interesting themes. So with Goya, um, what we see is reason having fallen asleep and monsters appearing, right? Uh, the mind is free to wander during dreams. Now, it's still very enlightenment, right? What happens when reason falls asleep? Our, our logic disappears, and we start to think of things being worse than they are. Right? And the whole book, right, all 82 prints, I think, total, in Los Caprichos, have no text, except for the text that's on the print itself. There's no sort of written text to read. It's a picture book. And... Sometimes there's an inscription underneath them. In this case, it's embedded in the image. And the entire book is about what happens when logic 
leaves us, when logic fails us. And the whole uh, book centers on, 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 on foolish behaviors. And we've seen this before with scenes of everyday life, right? Think about the ill-matched couple by Matt Size. Think about Peter Bruegel, right? Think about Bosch. We've seen all of these pictures where we've seen sort of uh, bad behavior as a moral example. But this is, I don't know if this has the same sort of moral example. It's just sort of like how, how ugly we can be as people revealing that side of our nature without the sort of uh, silver lining, you know, of humor to laugh at, right? Although some of Goya's prints are pretty humorous, right? Um, what are people doing carrying around beasts of burden on their back, right? Why do you have a donkey except to carry around the heavy stuff? So if you carry around the donkey, you know, you're doing something pretty darn stupid, right? So there is a sense of humor with that, right? And you can see that he has these sort of proverbial... Right, proverb-like uh, sayings that are printed at the bottom, right, in, in Spanish, they who cannot. And these were all then, you know, uh, printed, like I said, right around 1798. Um, eventually, and he sticks, his, like, he, he sticks his finger in the eye of almost everybody at one point or another. Uh, Goya had gone deaf. He had great distrust for human institutions. He felt himself an outsider looking in. And... Uh, he especially mocks government and the church. And this got him in some trouble, right? And eventually he was told to stop printing these, right? And we are very lucky to have a printed book version that came out before that rather than a later edition uh, down at the National Gallery. Now, some of them are humorous like this, right? And some of them are, are really kind of creepy, right? Here comes the boogeyman to suggest that maybe the things that we're scared of are, are, are quite real. That we have the capacity to be illogical and, and threatening to one another. Right? Uh, and so here, focusing on this terrified pair of children with the mother, looking at this faceless thing coming in. Right? Here comes the boogeyman. So our foolishness is not always silly and humorous but sometimes it's in fact quite frightening. And I think that the sleep of reason really points to that. This man, his, his imagined demons are really quite terrifying to you, the viewer. Uh, you know, this, the, the lynx, cat, the owls, the bats uh, swooping around him. Right? Uh, so this is this romantic idea of what happens when we lose it, right? Because that's when you are no longer bound by these sets of external pressures, right? The rules of society, the rules of logic, the rules of sanity, right? These are the things that, uh, that Romanticism says we can find who we truly are as humans, our individuality, our, uh, our freedom when we, when we look for these things. Okay. okay. Now, uh, one last thing about this is process-oriented. This is a print. Right? These are printed off of metal plates. So it functions very much like the engravings we saw by Durer or the etchings that we saw by Rembrandt. Right? Where you manipulate a flat surface, you rub it with ink, and the inconsistencies in the surface will hold that ink and transfer it to a piece of paper. So you create the matrix and can make multiples based on this. Right? This is also an etching-based technique where he's covered the plate with something and then immersed it in acid to bite the plate. But he's using a technique that's really new in the late 18th century. It's called aqua tint. And if we look closely now, right at the bats behind his head, um, what he's done is he's taken the plate and he's covered it with powdered resin. Right? Resin's sap from a tree, right? You dry it out, you can grind it up into dust, okay? And what he does is he sprinkles this over the top of the plate, and then he heats the plate up to low heat. And what happens when you heat up dried resin is it turns back to liquid again, and it sticks to the plate in the pattern that you see here. And then you take it with all of that sort of inconsistently covered plate, you stick that in the acid, 
and then you get this nice tone everywhere, rather than having to come back with Rembrandt in and do all that cross hatching to get the tone in, right? And what you can do then is you can stick it in the acid for a bit, you can bring it out and cover part of it up, put it back in again, bring it up and cover part of it up, and you get the effect of a wash draw, right, like a brush and ink. And you get a great, or a consistent background tone. And you can see the parts where he stopped it out, right? The wings of that owl, uh, the other owl directly off his haunches, the, his clothes, right? Even the words on his writing stool are all been stopped out. This is aqua tint, right? And, and Goya really is the single master of aqua tint. Uh, nobody was really ever any better than he was. Just as Rembrandt was like the best etcher and Durer maybe the best engraver, right? Uh, each one of them a different technique for manipulating that surface. Right? And once you get the tone down, you can come back and cover it up with the wax and go ahead and do an etching over the top of that. And that's exactly what he did to get the wings of the bat. Right? So it's just another technique uh, that you can learn about if you take a printmaking class from us. Right? We're working our way toward developing that. Now, Goya was more than a painter, or more than a printmaker. He was also a painter. And he had become the court painter to the king of Spain. King Carlos IV, or Charles IV, if you anglicize it, King Carlos IV of Spain. Right around the time that he's making these prints that are, you know, really being kind of sarcastic about government. And that's an interesting sort of back and forth between him and Carlos. In 1808, Carlos IV was dethroned. He was overthrown by a popular uprising in Spain. Spanish people rose up against the king of Spain, probably inspired quite a bit by what had happened in France back in the 1780s, with the idea of getting rid of the monarchy for something else. Now, in 1808, just across the Pyrenees, Napoleon is in power in France. He's now emperor of France. And he tells Carlos to come and stay with him. Bring your family, come to France, I'll keep you safe. I'll send my troops into Spain, we'll put down the riot, and you can go back and be king. Right? Sounds like a good deal for Carlos, right? Don't get killed. As soon as Carlos crosses the Pyrenees to France, Napoleon arrests him and his family, locks them up, and installs his brother as the king of France. Joseph Bonaparte in 1808 becomes the king of France. They squelch the riot, and they begin then to uh, execute the rioters. This lasted for the next six years. The brother of Napoleon on the throne in Spain, King Joseph Bonaparte of Spain, and in 1814, actually 1813 in Spain, the British troops under Wellington, as they begin to get rid of the menace of Napoleon, one of the first things they do is to drive the, drive the French out of Spain and reinstall the royal family. Okay, so far a little Napoleonic history for you, right? This picture was painted by Goya after... Joseph Bonaparte has been driven out after Carlos's son, Ferdinand, has been put on the throne after the original Spanish throne has been restored. And it's a huge picture, about 10 feet across. And it was painted to commemorate that horrible set of events where the French troops came in to squelch the riot and execute the rioters. And Goya's attempt with this picture is now to show the innocence of the rioters, the horrific nature of the French troops, to show war not as a dignified thing, but rather war as something horrific that's very romantic. Right? Very much romanticism is war as a horrific thing. Emma. So he 
Okay, so exactly. So what we have here is in the middle of the night, we read the picture, right? In the middle of the night, we have the riders having been rounded up and taken outside the city wall. So we can see that Goya makes it night, whether or not he didn't, we may have witnessed something like this, but this is, you know, remember, it's a pain, yeah. right? So what he, what he shows us is that they have been rousted up out of the city, brought outside the city walls of Madrid to be executed in the middle of the night. Now, why do you do that in the middle of the night? Why does any, anybody do anything in the middle of the night? Because you don't want to get caught, right? Because you don't want to get seen doing it. It's bad, right? When the Baltimore Colts left for Indianapolis two decades ago, they did it in the middle of the night, right? So that, that's part of it. So we've got the lamp. That big square cube is the lamp, right? That's illuminating the scene. We see in the background the city. We even see the steeple of a church, which suggests maybe that there's no sanctuary, right? There's no help for these people. And so the group of men that we see along the right are kind of like the boogeyman in that print we just saw. They're these sort of faceless agents of terror. And by not showing their face, he adds to that. Because they're not human anymore, right? And you'll notice that they stand in lockstep, so they're just like the machine of war. Yeah. And we see their guns one after the other. And we see the people coming up in anguish, being led to their mass execution. And if we look at the people, I've got a detail, right? If we look at the people who are being executed, you'll notice that we have a monk, a Franciscan monk, who could be more innocent, right? We have a guy in a white shirt with his arms up like Jesus. You know, absolutely, I'm unarmed. About to get shot. And you'll notice what Goya does is he takes this moment of high drama, right? The guns are about to go, and that shirt's going to explode like something out of an R rated gangster film, you know? The end of The Godfather, Sonny at the Turnstiles, or something like that, right? It's like, wow. And he tells you exactly what's happening. He says, look at, the, look at the group of people at his feet, right? There's blood everywhere. So there's this high moment of, of fear and terror. And for Goya, the idea that folly exists, that mankind loses his rationality, right, brings out in many ways the worst of us. Right? And romanticism often fo focuses on that. We'll talk a bit more about this. Why they're so interested in sort of scenes of, of, of ickiness. I guess that's my next slide, right? <sighs> right? The foreground just covered with bloody dead bodies. And it goes back to something that came out of the Romantic movement, which is this idea of the sublime. I think it's on the worksheet, right? The idea of the sublime. Now, we use the word sublime kind of haphazard anymore, not the way it was originally intended. Yeah, I thought it was like the Okay, so let's go over it, right? This will help out. Okay, so what the, okay, so we use sublime as like, you know, you might hear it in a movie, oh, that dessert was just sublime. And, and in a way, that's kind of correct, but in a way, it's not. Because the theory of the sublime is an aesthetic theory that came, was brought up by Edmund Burke, right? That's on the worksheet, in the late 18th century, 1770s, 1780s, right around there. And the idea is that all aesthetic reactions, okay, an aesthetic reaction, reaction to any work of art, right? Whether it's music, literature, paintings. Any reaction to a work of art is worthwhile. Halfway home. Okay. Any reaction to a work of art is worthwhile, and we shouldn't put a value judgment on it. So what the sublime suggests is that things that cause revulsion, revulsion is an aesthetic reaction. Anguish, fear is an aesthetic reaction. That those are every bit as valid as a sense of beauty. Okay? So the sublime suggests that, uh, as part of this, that in fact the reactions that we have to things is often stronger when the reaction is heightened by fear. 
where the reaction is heightened by revulsion. That makes it much more long-lasting. I, I don't know. I, there are movies that I've seen that I still can't forget that image that took place in it, you know? Uh, the girl on the tracks in Saw, or, or the alien coming out of the guy's chest, you know, 40 years ago now. Right? There's certain things you just can't forget once you've seen them. And the sublime suggests that there's a certain power to that. Right? So, what we find when the sublime becomes this interest in, in, in sort of strong aesthetic reactions right, that are uh, not necessarily positive ones. But what's react what is positive is having some, having a reaction, right? It's better to feel something than nothing when you look at a work of art or hear a work of music. Right? It's better to feel something than nothing. And that works that are horrific have the opportunity to punch you harder, you know, than the road code, you know, right? Or even neoclassicism, that I just started driving, right? So the supply becomes this really important part of, of uh, romantic, aesthetic creations. And they find it not only in, in horror, like this, but they also find it in nature. The absolute power of nature can have that same strong aesthetic experience. It doesn't have to be blood and guts, right? Uh, it can be simply feeling overwhelmed by something that you see, right? And you can have these in outside of art, right? You can have these uh, sitting on the prow of a boat in a storm, right? Rolling the windows down. There's a painter, Turner. We're going to look at it, right? An English painter, uh, Joseph Ballard William Turner. Fantastic landscape painter. He used to read the weather reports in London and book a train so he could go right into the heart of the storm. And as soon as he hit the storm, he'd roll the window down in his compartment and leave his head out, right? Just so he could feel it, that power, right? And I don't know, I, I love storms for that reason. I mean, I, you know, I, I, when yesterday it was so windy out, I was like, I. You know, took the dogs just hung out outside for it. It's, it's overwhelming in a way, you know? And so that's all elements of this blood. Is that clear enough? Good? Okay. So this interest in blood and guts is one element of that. Now, this is not, the, you think this is bad. The next slide is not for the squeamish, right? <clears throat> Goya stayed in Spain during the six years that the French were in control. When Napoleon Bonaparte was, or Napoleon's brother, was the king. As you might imagine, the Spanish were not particularly keen on this, right? And uh, don't like being occupied by a foreign power, by the French. So there is constant sort of hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, right? And like I said, after he's ousted, so this is the 3rd of May in 1808, but it was painted in 1814, right, after the Spanish got back to power. Now, these constant warfare, this sort of ground warfare, ground offensive against the French, is where we get the word guerrilla, right? The little war, right? Not guerrillas, monkeys, right? But guerrilla came, it was actually first coined during the Spanish uprising against Joseph Bonaparte, right? That's where that term was first coined. And there were constant skirmishes between the resistance and the French. And Goya witnessed it. He was there. He never left, right? And he did a series of prints, more engraved or more etchings and aquatints during the war. Never published them. He was afraid to, I think, right? They weren't published until well after his his death in the 1820s. Yikes, right? The things that he saw. Uh, in a series called The Disasters of War, sometimes with very satiric titles, Great Heroism with Dead Men, right? Uh, but again, it's this interest in the sublime that leads us to these images that are difficult to look at, but impossible to forget, right? That's the sublime in a nutshell. Now again, like I said, these weren't printed until after his death. He's probably afraid of what might happen. 
Nobody knew where the future was leading, right? Nobody knew what would happen the next year. You publish these, you know what side you're on, uh, what side you're against, and what happens if that group comes back to power, right? Uh, so publish only later. And you can get away with that when you've got a print because you've got the matrix already created and somebody else can ink it up and print it. Right? Now, not all romanticism is so icky, right? And so violent. Uh, although there's a lot of dark scenes in romantic art. We're going to look at England, and in particular, we're going to be looking at landscape painting in England, because that's another huge element of romanticism. Uh, in fact, most of our English romantics are interested in landscape. So Constable is an artist who's deeply interested. He's a landscape specialist. And he's certainly been looking back at Dutch landscapes from the 17th century. But he's confronted with a problem. We talked about this before. Remember when we were talking about Dutch art, we talked about the fact that different kinds of art were viewed as being more or less valuable. Right? That history painting, whether it's contemporary history, like kings and queens and their actions, or it's Roman history, or biblical narratives, or mythology things, these were seen to be the most valuable kind of painting. Because they demanded the most expertise from the artist. And so when it came time to sell them, they demanded the highest prices. The artists who made them got the most respect. And then the food chain sort of went down from there, right? Portraits were pretty high, because you had things in the portraits that would require more. Because, you know, the whole point of history painting is that you had to do everything. You had to paint animals, you had to paint still life, you had to paint landscape, you had to paint portraits, you had to paint it all, right? And it, so anybody who did this must be like the greatest artist out there. And then, the, like I said, the chain went down from there. At the very, very, very bottom was landscape. This just really wasn't valued. It was the cheapest kind of painting that anybody could do. And this is true in Holland in the 17th century. It's true in England in the 19th century. Right? Landscape was beloved, but not valued in the same way. Does that make sense? Right? In other words, it didn't bring the artist any status, and it certainly didn't line his pockets as well. And so Constable, as a landscape specialist, why would anybody be a landscape specialist? Because you're good at it, right? Why do you specialize in anything? You find a niche, right? But he decides that what he wants to do is he wants to elevate the status of landscape. He wants to make sure that landscape painting gets the respect it's due. Right? And he doesn't do something like Claude Lorraine did, which was to stick mythology into a landscape. Remember the Judgment of Paris? Right? That's kind of his way of doing that, right? That's not what Constable does. Constable decides that the way he's going to make landscape painting respectable is he's going to paint it huge. And he has a series of six pictures that are six feet across. Six feet across, right? He even calls them six footers, right? Uh, a series of landscapes, and that's a scale, right? Six feet. <coughs> Fingertip to fingertip. It's a scale that was usually reserved for historical pictures. So you can do big, <coughs> big landscapes, as opposed to little things like this, which is the normal scale. You know, two and a half feet maybe across. And that simple scale jump will be one of the things that starts to get people to sit up and pay attention to what landscapes can do. So this picture of the white horse is up in, up in the Frick collection in New York. And it shows a, a, a way of life that hasn't been changed by progress. That's also very much romantic. Nature doesn't change. Nature keeps us sort of at our roots, you know? That all of the progress, he's living in London at this point, Constable is. He goes back to the area where he grew up, in Essex County, to do these. And what he wants to find are these areas where, if you look the right direction, 
nothing's changed, which is nature, right? Man doesn't change nature. Man can't. Nature is unchanged. And if you look at these things, it's a simple way of life. It's a river with a, a ferry crossing the path from one side to the other, the horse being ferried across the river on the left, uh, more cattle grazing in the water on the right. There's a hut uh, next to the tree. The hut belonged to a farmer that was there when he grew up, that was still there here. 80 years old, never left the property for more than four days in his life. He made a really lot. Right? That floor constable is this great symbol of being in harmony with nature. Nature doesn't change. Things don't change. Right? All of this now in his book. Now, so he's uh, approaching nature as this, this great force. Right? That he wants to bring to the screen, if you will. So... Um, the river is the Stewart River. You can actually map where he is in all of these because many of these buildings are still there, even today, right? And people have done and sort of done a Google map sort of thing and mapped out exactly where he was and where he was looking. And to get these six footers, you might imagine he's not out there with an easel, right? This goes back to Peyton's question from last week, right? Why aren't they painting outside? They don't have tubes of paint yet, right? They might have little satchels and whatnot, but also, even if you did, a six-foot painting, right, six by four feet, crazy, right? You're not walking out with that, sitting by the side of the river. You, you're going to do that in the studio. And so what Constable did as a process was he did go out and paint on site, but he did certain things, he did studies of clouds, because he wants to get the change in nature, right, the movement of the clouds. So down at the National Guard, we have a cloud study that was probably painted outside, Right? And he would take these, he would take sketches he would do, and he would make compositions, right? Uh, based on the life sketches that he did on site, based on trying to capture uh, the changes in color that you get, which is something you can't get in a drawing, right? The changes in color that come as clouds come and go. Take this all back into the studio, and he would make up the composition. And usually he would make up a composition in normal landscape size, you know, like yay. Right? Uh, the recording doesn't help, but yay, uh, two and a half, three feet across max, right? But then he's faced with this problem. He's got this sketch, he likes it, he's got the composition worked out, he's worked in the clouds, and he's, how do you translate a two and a half picture, foot picture into a six foot picture? Right? If your painting is this big, you've got some problems in trying to blow it up. You can't just blow it up because the relationship of the size of your brush to the size of your canvas is A to B, right? And when you get a big canvas, you've got to figure out how am I going to put the colors down? How am I going to work it out, right? How am I going to block it in? And so what Constable did, and this seems kind of crazy to us, is he actually did full-sized sketches of the six-foot pictures. So he cloud studies, various other drawings, bring them in, make a small study, take the small study and use it to make a six-foot study, a six-foot study for the final composition. We've got it, right? The National Gallery has the six-foot study for the white horse. So this is just his sketch to sort of figure out how things work, how the light works, how he's going to lay the paint on the canvas. It's intentionally unfinished. He's never planned on showing anybody this. He did this for himself as part of the process of translating a small-scale painting, which was the norm, up into something that could then elevate the status of painting. Okay. As it turns out, the white horse you know, it was one of the other six-footers. It wasn't the white horse, it was the haywood. One of the other six-footers played a prominent role in French landscape painting. It was actually sent to France in 1824, it was shown at the Salon of the Royal Academy in 1824. And a lot of French artists went, holy moly, natural landscape, right? Landscape that doesn't look artificially created. I mean, they've seen the Dutch, but now somebody's doing this in big, right? And this is a, a, an important moment in sort of the steps that lead us to impressions. It is Constable's work making it to Paris 
and impressing the Jesus out of sorry, the heck out of uh, a bunch of French painters who are about two generations before the Impressionists, and gives them the idea that why don't we go out and paint once? Changing technology. So, Constable, uh, one of two landscape painters we'll look at, very much interested in trying to capture the power of nature, right? From the cloud studies, from the various studies, and then focusing on, a, on scenes where nature is so powerful that progress simply can't touch it, right? These places where it's the same as it's ever been. Uh, a couple of nice little details. Maybe only one at this point, right? So there's our horse. And you can see he's just kind of blocked in the horse. I wish I could do a horse that well in seven or eight strokes of paint, right? Uh, but capturing it exactly. And now our, 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 our men here have, have sort of, you know, they're working in harmony with nature. They're going to move their way across this gently flowing Stewart River uh, to take the horse off to the other side. But again, it's a draft horse, so it's about us working nature and at the same time unable to really change anything. Now, I already mentioned him, Turner is the quintessential romantic landscape painter. Uh, there was a movie about him a couple years ago. It was up for an Oscar, uh, Mr. Turner. It was pretty cool, actually. Well, I think so, because I'm an art dork, right? But uh, well worth seeing. Uh, Turner loves, as opposed to Constable, right? Constable's nature is pretty sedate, right? I mean, you know, we've got the power of the clouds passing by, but there's no sense of being in any kind of danger within nature. <laughs> Turner, on the other hand, is really focused on nature as a force, nature as a power. And in this case, early in his career, he's painted the place where the, the Thames River, flowing through London, actually hits the ocean. Have you ever seen a place where that happens? Where, like, the, like, crossing the bar, right, having to cross the bar? I grew up in Oregon, in the Columbia River, right? Half of America is the Columbia River watershed. When it hits the ocean, the bar there has waves, standing waves at about 40 feet, right? Because of the force of the river, especially when the tide is coming and hitting that and just butting up against it. It's this incredible force. People die every year, to this day, crossing the Columbia Bar. The Thames also had this place where it hit the Medway, and it just could swamp the boat at any moment. And Turner's trying to capture that. Our struggle against the forces of nature, and on a certain level, the futility of that structure, uh, that struggle, sorry. And so we have a, a group of men on a tiny little dory. We have boats being tossed around. Uh, I don't know if that's a float in the foreground, the wooden bit in the left foreground. But at the same time, there's this sense that they've got to get in because there's a storm brewing, which is only going to make things worse. Right? This is our struggle against the forces of nature. This is part of that sublime aesthetic reaction, things that are powerful, memorable, and long-lasting. And the romantic interest in freedom, right? Nature providing that. Now, Turner had an incredibly long career, right? Painted up until almost 1850. So this is very early in his career. Not very. He started painting in the 1780s, uh, but still early-ish. As he progressed in his career, his paintings got increasingly abstract. And instead of illustrating recognizable places, he would often use the paint as a way of evoking the power of nature. Sometimes with biblical scenes, but not always. Right? So here, the evening of the deluge, right? This is the night of the great flood of Noah. And it's the moment when nature is going to destroy everything mankind has done up until that point. Right? The evening of the flood. And we see in the foreground, right, we see Noah and the ark and trying to begin to get it ready to become afloat and maybe survive this heaven sent uh, terror. But the way that he applies the paint, if we look at the picture itself, it's not that descriptive. 
it's more expressive where he's using the paint as if it were the force of the winds, as if it were the force of the clouds, the force of the waves, that he's trying to use the paint to give you that sense of the swirling power of nature and the futility of us in it, our inability to sort of uh, fight against that. So if we look at the, closely at the, at the, uh, the birds in the sky, we notice that the, there's this glowing sun in the middle, but the way he's scumbling the paint around, you get the sense of the swirl of, of the weather patterns, of the growing storm that will swamp the earth. And everywhere we look, we see waves breaking and, and sea animals leaping uh, in the foreground. Turner using, I thought I had two details, but I don't. I cut it, accidentally cut a detail out. I had a detail of the lower right corner of the crocodiles uh, down there. But there's a certain point Turner's pictures become abstract. Where he's not illustrating something that he sees. But instead he's expressing the feeling of the power of nature. And that is his single great strength as a painter. We're lucky to have a half dozen Turners floating around uh, DC. Now given the youth of America at this time, and given the fact that we grew out of Britain, we might expect there to be also romantic landscape painters here in the United States. And that's certainly the case. Thomas Cole is very much a romantic landscape painter here in America. And this picture, quite significantly smaller, maybe two feet across the bottom, maybe 18 inches, two feet. And he presents us the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York. This is where he lived, was in New York State. And he presents us the, the Catskills at the moment that the sun is rising. And if you if you ever go hiking and whatnot, you know that when the sun comes up, um, all the dew, all the rays of the night before, you get these wonderful rises of mist as the heat of the sun hits things for the first time. And, and you get the evaporation of, of, of the dew on the ground. And that's what cold is capturing here. We look down from this incredibly elevated point of view, down into that valley, and we see uh, the mist rising up from the trees, or at the top of the peak, just as the sun is about to break, we see more mist rising from the tops of the mountains as well. And what Cole, I think, is showing us is that this is pretty much exactly the way it looked when God created it in the first place. There's absolutely untouched. He's there. Well, he's not, right? He's in the king of the studio, right? But he, he puts us there, right? We get to be there. But because even though we're there, right, even though our presence is suggested, nothing has changed. This looks exactly the way it did on that day of creation, almost. And it gives you this sense of the steam rising up, that everything is just coming into being as the sun shines on it. Almost suggesting it's the very, very first time. Now, he's one of a group of painters that are working in upstate New York. That was a hotbed of landscape painting in the early 19th century in America. They were all working in the Hudson River Valley, various locations up and down the Hudson as it leads out of New York City up and eventually into Massachusetts. Right? And they're working all through this, so they became known as the Hudson River School. Think of it as a school of fish, not as the school of Marymount, right? A group of painters working in a similar fashion. Cole is one of the founding members of the Hudson River School. And these landscape paintings got to be incredibly popular because they had just opened up the Erie Canal. In 1825, they opened up the Erie Canal, which began to proceed sort of westward expansion in the United States. And the idea of manifest destiny, that we're going to populate the country, we, the white guys, right, are going to populate the country from shore to shore. 
And when they opened up the Erie Canal, the idea that you could push further westward opened up this idea that America was this amazing, and again, this is totally the, the settler's point of view, right? This amazing virgin territory where no one lives. Right? And Cole's tapping into that same sentiment. And this landscape's become incredibly popular because people have this taste for, especially in New York City, people have these tastes for paintings that show us this great unspoiled landscape that's waiting you know, for the Americans, which is to say the settlers. This is coming up next. There's a close-up of the, the sun about to rise over the hills. He's very good about making the paint actually look like the thing he's painting. So the clouds end up almost looking like little three-dimensional clouds and the steam almost looking like steam. And the view he gives us is almost as if it's the view that God might have had at the moment of, of creation, uh, looking down over this uh, burgeoning landscape, uh, the steam suggesting that, that, that initial birth of everything. I always like this detail in the foreground where uh, first we see the power of nature and that we have this ratty old tree that storms have broken but continue to survive. You have a broken limb just out of my detail here. But you also notice that we have, uh, I don't know if this is a sign of man or not, there's a rock on top of a rock. It almost does, doesn't it? It almost looks like a skull, but it's, it almost looks like it's been uh, consciously placed there by somebody. And not in a way that's disrespectful or ruins the landscape, but maybe this idea of how to commune with nature in a way that doesn't destroy it. Now, one of the things we know about Tom and Thomas Cole is that he belonged to a group called the Freemasons. Have you heard of the Freemasons before? Yeah? You, what can you, what do you, do you know anything about him, Emma? Yeah. Are you, are you in downtown by the 16th Street? No, there's one there too. Okay. Very good. So the Freemasons, right? Okay, Freemasons, we parse the word out. A mason is a stone cutter. Okay? And the Freemasons believe that they had descended as a group from the stone cutters' guilds of the Middle Ages. And even earlier, like the very beginning of the Middle Ages, right? The stone cutters guild, the people who belong to this craft society that carved the stones that built all of the great buildings in the world. Right? And they even said, and this is where the secretive part comes from, that they built the Temple of Solomon from the Bible, which was built on plans that were given by God. Right? So they're very secretive about what they know because if they did, if they can get this myth that they came from those, then they've got God's plans, right? Uh, and in addition to that, God is a sculptor, right? God forms Adam from the earth. They're forming things from stone. They see themselves as God-like, but they're still kind of humble about it, right? So to be a mason, and I don't know because I'm not a mason, right? If I were a mason, by the way, I couldn't tell you, right? It's very secret. It's true, right? It's culty. Yeah, it's culty. Exactly right. Um, my grandfather was a mason, and I have one of their books. I shouldn't say that out loud because someone's going to kill me. Right? Right? With this, it's, and it's full of symbols and whatnot. And there's the, the Temple of the Scottish Rite down on 16th. There's the Washington Memorial in Alexandria up on the hill. Those are Masonic <coughs> monuments, right? And they're full of uh, secret symbols and and it's, it, yeah. So you belong to the Masons, and you were they didn't cut stone anymore. That's why they're free Masons, right? They're no longer really part of that guild. They're free of that, but they're in this other secret society. Okay. Washington, George Washington was a Freemason, right? Most of our founding fathers were Freemasons. This is that stupid Nick Cage movie, National National Treasure. Thank you. It was based was based exactly <laughs> on this, right? Sorry, I don't mean to be judgmental. That Nick Cage movie, that noisy Nick. Cage Okay, uh, was, was based on the idea that Freemasonry, and there's this, there's this idea that Freemasons' ideas are, are the basis of the layout of Washington, D.C. Yeah. So, 
Cole was a Freemason, right? And one of the things that the Freemasons said, this, and the stuff from the 19th century is kind of out there, right? People can, can research this. They said that we are all stones to be carved by God. Right? We are waiting to be formed like Adam was by God. Right? And they, as Freemasons, carve stones in God, in reverence to God. Right? So, in a lot of Cole's works, we find rocks form a really important part of the form. And in this case, rocks that aren't necessarily carved or manipulated, but they are kind of, because you've got that rock on a rock, right? And up above it, on the upper left, with that broken tree, there's another one. But it's been consciously placed there out of respect to nature. And for Cole, what this meant was that he became a very ardent uh, preservationist, right? an environmentalist. He felt that mankind's progress into nature was something that was spoiled. And he would often choose these scenes where we as humans had gone, but he would excise any sign of us being there, right? And show it the way it should have been in the first place. And that longing for a past that's maybe gone is also kind of romantic in this way, <coughs> a romantic idea. And it's what we saw with Constantine going back home to Essex. So this is all, these are all elements of romanticism, right? We have one last romantic landscape to look at, and then we're going to move on to the next movement. Um, Germany is the country that we most often associate with romanticism because of their music, because of their uh, theater pieces. Um, Friedrich is uh, perhaps our best example, and I think that this is one of two Friedrich pictures in all of America. Uh, coming out of Germany, where we see people having gone out into the landscape, into nature, uh, to commune with it. And what Friedrich loves to do is to give us surrogates there. <laughs> Cole does it now and again, but Friedrich does it all the time, and they almost always have their backs to us. So that we look at them looking at what we're looking at. <laughs> How's that for a word salad, right? We look at them as they are looking at the exact same thing we are, but just further in. So we have these two fellows hiking through the landscape, frozen tundra. Again, an inhospitable landscape, a place for no one to be. The power that nature has could possibly kill us. But they've gone through this hike along the side of a frozen lake, in this twilight, right, uh, dust-like atmosphere, in a landscape that shows absolutely no signs of any kind of human intervention except these two lonely people you know, on the side of the lake. This is a, a kind of a hallmark of, of, of Friedrich's kind of pictures. There they, there they are, right? And dressed with their walking sticks and their hats and their coats, and they they're talking to each other. You can tell this even in this tiny detail, right? That detail is by no bigger than the end of my thumb, right? Uh, but you get the sense that they're sort of pausing to, to contemplate nature. In Germany, in particular, nature was seen in the way that the Dutch saw sign of the hand of God, right? That if you contemplate nature, you can discover something more about the God who created it all. And by doing so, you maybe find out something about yourself. You can reflect on the person who, you know, he who created you as well, as the nature that you're seeing. And there's a sense with our figures here that they're doing that, that exact thing. They're sort of talking about what it, does it all mean. And Friedrich does a number of these images. His most famous is, is this one, which you may have seen before. Uh, a man, again, seen from the back, going out for a walk in nature and taking a moment just to think about what does all this splendor, what does all this power, uh, what does the hand of God reveal to me about myself? But again, Friedrich loves these figures seen from the back. And so for our figures in 
the National Gallery picture, what are they going to be learning out here? What are they supposed to see? And I don't think Friedrich ever really tells us. Part of it is, how to say this, uh, how insignificant we are relative to nature. Tiny little uh, sort of existential anxieties that you might have, right? The kind of thing you think about, I, I don't know, when the, when, the, uh, when the eclipse happened, right? I sort of, it made me very aware of sort of like we're on this ball, you know, and there are these other balls in space. And, and it just it gave me this sort of like weird sort of sense about how nothing matters anymore, you know? It's just we're so tiny in, in it all. And, and Friedrich's picture gets that. But the other thing he does, and he does this a lot, is he'll include these elements that suggest sort of maybe some of the lessons we might learn. Despite all the snow, despite the chill, the ice on the lake, grass is coming back. Rebirth. That winter may look forbidding, Winter may look like a frozen, endless tundra. But nature will come back. Spring will return. It's a cycle, life is. And we just go through these moments when it looks cold and barren and we feel insignificant. But spring will come back. And we see that right in the foreground with the green coming through the melting snow as our figures have gone out. So they're contemplating their place in nature, but also realizing that all of nature is a power. All of nature is a power that, that, that goes through these cycles. So that's, that's romanticism, right? Landscape heavy, uh, uh, horror, kind of a strong theme. Uh, all of these places where uh, things are no longer contained, right? by either rules or conventions or institutions. Right? And everything we've looked at has that theme. Now, Romanticism remains a current in art all the way into the early 20th century. I mean, we could talk about Romantic painters still being around for the rest of the 19th century in one way or another. It doesn't really go away. But in the middle of the 19th century, it is superseded in a way as the most, see, in the 1820s, Romanticism was the most avant-garde kind of art, right? It's the most forward-looking, the newest, right? It's all the rage. By the 1840s, it had, become, had come to be replaced by a new movement, a reaction to Romanticism. And ever since the Baroque period, we've kind of talked, ever since the Renaissance, we've talked about art being a series of reactions, right? I don't like what dad did. I'm going to be a mannerist. I don't like what dad did. I'm going to the Baroque, right? Neoclassicism, Rococo. Rococo, Neoclassicism, Romanticism. We've seen this sort of pendulum swinging back and forth between different kinds of art. There's a reaction to Romanticism that begins in the 1840s. Right. It's the next movement called realism, something more realistic, in other words, more everyday life. Right. But to talk about it, we've got to give a little, got to back up for a second and talk about French history. We're going to be looking at France now for quite a while. Most of the rest of the class, not entirely, but a lot of it. Right. So we need to go back and cover French history just a little bit because... If you're like me, you don't have this stuff memorized, right? You need a reminder, okay? So we saw already the French Revolution, 1789, right? Led to a, a retribution meted out on the aristocracy that eventually led to the election of Napoleon as first consul of France under the new government, and then he takes over as emperor in 1804. Right? So again, politically, we move from a monarchy to a very brief attempt at democracy back to a monarchy again. 
under Napoleon. But it was not for Napoleon a monarchy of inheritance. It was a coup. It was a military takeover. Right? And Napoleon is then emperor of France, and as we've seen, doing some damage in Spain as well, to say nothing of the low countries, Belgium and Holland, parts of Germany, for ten years. Until he's finally overthrown by the British at the Battle of Waterloo in 1814. After the Battle of Waterloo, the French decide, let's go back to having just a king. Right? Our little experiment in democracy led us to an emperor. That's worse than a king. We're going to restore the kings to the throne. The period of the restoration in France was the restoral, restoring of the French monarchy. First under Louis XVIII, was a nephew of the Louis who got beheaded, Louis XVI, and succeeded by Charles X. So the restoration period in France goes from 1814 to 1830, under these two men. Right? Again, a little French history through art. Okay? Are we okay so far? So we have one revolution, 1789, leads us to Napoleon. He's overthrown. We go back to the monarchy, back to the way things had always been. And our two portraits here, very much kingly, right? The fleur-de-lis, the furs, the crowns, right? The thrones. 1830, there's a revolution against Charles X, the second French Revolution. Also known as the July Revolution, because it took place, guess when, right, in July. And this famous picture by Delacroix, very romantic picture as well, dead bodies in the foreground, right, the horror of the sublime, shows a woman leading the French troops in an uprising against a nameless enemy who is the throne. She's the, whoa, girl. She's the embodiment of liberty, right? She's an allegorical figure. She's their inspiration, leading them. And we've got everybody, uh, black and white, young and old, rising up, right? This is our second revolution. People often confuse this with the first one. After the second revolution, the French decide on a new form of government. Let's see what's coming up, right? They decide to follow the British example of a constitutional monarchy. Does anybody know what a constitutional monarchy is? Have heard that term before? A constitutional monarchy. That's right. They have a king and oh, not so much the prime minister, it's the parliament. Yeah, the king right? and stuff. That's right. So the way there's like a group of people who they just do each other. That's correct. So you have with a constitutional monarchy, you have a monarch, right, but he does not have absolute power anymore. Yeah. His power is checked by parliament, and parliament makes most of the major decisions. Now, Britain still kind of has this, although even more so because the king doesn't really do anything, or well, the queen doesn't really do anything, yeah. right, except have offspring, mm -hmm. right, except to keep the line going, right? So uh, this had been in place in England since, what, the Magna Carta, the idea of the constitutional monarchy. So France decides hey, there's a nice compromise, right? Let's try this as well. We'll put a new king in. Uh, I've got his picture coming up in a second. King Louis Philippe. He will be a constitutional monarch. Uh, he will be checked by parliament. He can't do anything he wants. And of course, the reason they had the second uprising is that Charles X had become sort of out of touch with the people. Okay? So here's our little French history lesson. Right? 1830, second revolution, the attempt to establish a new form of government called the Constitutional Monarchy, where Parliament would check the power of the king. It doesn't work. The French aren't very good at this, right? Uh, the king, Louis Philippe, begins to assert himself more and more as a dictator. Uh, stepping on the opposition, 
setting up rules that nobody likes and not listening to their concerns, ignoring Parliament as they try to check his power. And this led to a number of resistance uh, factors working against him. And one of them was the fact that there was, um, had been established under the, the first revolution, a free press where people could criticize government openly. And Daumier gives us this amazing image of Louis-Philippe the king, seated on a piece of furniture that looks like it's from the 18th century, an old king's chair. And he's depicted as a glutton, fat as can be, right? And on the right, we see people tax collectors taking money from the poor, putting it in baskets, running up this monster ramp into his mouth to feed him money. And he's sitting on this throne, which is in fact a commode, and he's crapping. He's defecating. And what he's defecating are a bunch of laws, making posts in the parliament, right? creating administrative posts for his friends, and those are being carried off in the background to a parliamentary building with the French flag flying. This is really acerbic, right? Now, we're used to political cartoons that just make fun of everybody, you know, uh, regardless of who's in power, right? We're used to seeing this. In the 1830s, when, when Daumier is doing this, this is rare. This is part of a new system, uh, a new check on power. That's that is the the ability of the free press, right? Um, so, I have a couple of details. Right there, we see the poor, obviously poor, giving what little money they have to the rich, uh, to this very very fat and wealthy man uh, whose facial features look very similar to Louis Philippe, and they're now going to carry everything once the baskets are full up this ramp. Um, and feed them to Louis, who now nominations uh, for Paris, uh, a note, bread, a prefect, right? Various things are just coming out the other end. He's stuffing it from one end with money, and out come government posts, something we definitely don't need more of. Right? And these are all then being carried back. I'm sorry, this is kind of grainy, back to the parliamentary building. He titles this Gargantua. Gargantua is the title of a 16th century French play by a man named Rabelais. It's in the worksheet, the next worksheet is coming up. Rabelais was to the French what Shakespeare kind of is to the Brits. He's this great national treasure, this great Renaissance playwright. And Gargantua was this uh, satirical novel, very scatological, a lot of people pee and crap in it, you know, and it's centered around this insatiable giant who ate everything around him, right, and his bodily functions because of that. And he titles this Gargantua, right, as if to say that's exactly what Louis Philippe is, as he's asserting more and more power. This is a pointed criticism of the president. It got Daumier arrested. He spent six months in jail because of this book. When he got out, he just kept doing it, right? wasn't going to be stopped by this. But this is part of our now our, our little French history lesson. We'll wrap up the history lesson and get into the art uh, so we're all set up for after Christmas. Okay? As you might imagine, with Louis Philippe under this kind of public criticism, right? These are published in two different journals. People are waiting for it to come out. Uh, Daumier with his with his his caricatures, right? Uh, People were so excited for the new prince to come out that they would actually come and wait outside the newspaper shop, right? For, and Daumier made little models of people that were going to be uh, mocked that week and would put them in the window so people couldn't wait to see, right? And uh, even after having been arrested. Well, with <coughs> Louis Philippe being a jerk, with people recognizing this and making fun of him, you got to imagine that his days are numbered. And in 1848, we have the third revolution, right? So three within 60 years for the French. 
1848, the third revolution, actually the last of the big revolutions for France. And Daumier was there, he paints it in this picture at the Phillips Collection, are the people rising up to fight in the streets against Louis Philippe and then to establish a new kind of government, no more monarchy, a president. Right? Yeah. I have a quick question about, so you said that in the first revolution they were, fit, they redid the constitution or whatever, that way they could have freedom of press? I don't, don't quote me on that. I know, but yeah. like, I'm just saying that like, clearly he kind of needed it. He took that away from them. He tried to. He's trying to. Trying to, but at a certain point when things are cemented well enough, Right, people care enough that they're not gonna they're not gonna fall for that, right? Yeah. Now what happened after the third revolution, things got kinda ugly. What happened? They elected a, a man to be uh, uh, his name was Louis. Tell some freeze as they say in French. His name is Louis. He elected him to be uh, the, the president of France, right? And it could be a president now, real president, four year term, right? Non-negotiable, no re-elections. Four years, Louis going to be. Turns out, Louis was a cousin of Bonaparte. He's Louis Bonaparte. And so in 1848, he gets a three-year term, right? 1851, he declares himself Napoleon III, right? And he's on the throne for the next 20 years. No more revolution this time. Turns out the Germans did it for him. In 1871, the Germans, under Bismarck, other one Bismarck, stormed France to drive Napoleon III out. All they really care about is Napoleon III won't do what Bismarck wants him to do. They want him out of office, give the French back the kind of government they want. Right? Ugly episode, we'll talk about it later. Okay? At this point, we're now 1848, Third Revolution, the attempt to set up representative government with a president. And one of the things that's going to happen with the 1848 revolution that hadn't happened as well before is they're going to set up a series of social programs to help the disenfranchised people of the country. Because that's something that Louis Philippe, Charles X, Louis XVIII, none of them had really cared about the little guy. Right? So the new government that's being set up in 1848, this is before he declares himself emperor, their intention is to be more egalitarian, right? To help everybody. And so there's a series of, of government-sponsored um, initiatives to help the poor, to help the hungry, right? to love the playing field. And this brings about a, an amazing um, change in attitude in France in 1848 where people are paying more attention to the dignity of everybody, the dignity of the poor, the dignity of the working class, the dignity of the, the peasants who work the fields that feed the rest of the country. And what we see happening with the Third Revolution, 1848, is a new movement in art that, like the government at that time, is interested in the working class, the lives and the dignity people who work in the fields primarily, but also in the cities as well. Right? And this new movement is called realism. Not because it's realistic, but because it focuses on real life, real issues. Right? Everyday life of the working man. So it coincides directly with this third revolution. And that's what we'll pick up and look at as we blast ahead after Thanksgiving. So have a good week off. We'll see you back here in a week. And like I said, after the next after the next worksheet, they'll all be the one on due on Monday. They'll all be uh, optional from this point forward. Okay.